here we are. All right, so I want to start out, I guess, by asking for a little honesty. Can you remember a time when you saw someone else being bullied, harassed, or intimidated, and you stayed quiet? It's kind of a common fear-based reaction that instead of speaking up when we see someone else in trouble, we just stay there mute and rooted to the spot. We see what's happening almost as if it were a movie playing out in front of us, one where the script is already set in stone. And I know what that feels like. Um, there have been times when I saw somebody else being abused or degraded right in front of me, but whether I was afraid of what might happen or just caught by surprise, I didn't make a move to help. And you might be surprised to hear that even hero researchers aren't immune from this kind of sideline-sitting impulse. Um, one researcher I know, who shall remain nameless, actually uh, watched a car accident happen just a few feet away from him. But because he was in a hurry to get to work for an important meeting, he actually just sped right past, and he regretted it afterwards. And you've heard about what psychologists call the bystander effect, which basically says that the more people that are watching an assault or a disaster play out, the less likely any one of those people is to intervene. And when it comes to heroic intervention, being a quote-unquote good person isn't always enough. In the real world, what often makes the difference between a hero and a bystander is the decision that you're able to make in a split second. Um, a strong moral code is good, but it might not actually mean very much unless you know how to push past the pressures of the moment and take action. And nowadays, this principle is more important than ever. Um, in the US, as you might know, um, hate crimes broke out in a big way after the most recent presidential election. Um, I think it was the week after the election alone, the Southern Poverty Law Center recorded hundreds of incidents of hateful intimidation and harassment. And then after Brexit here in the UK, uh, hate crimes also spiked to record levels. And you know, rabble rousers were seeking to demonize the differences between people. And as a result of all of that, uh, millions of members of targeted groups now are fearing that they're gonna be among the next victims. And the destructive impact of hate crimes is vast. Um, victims actually report higher than normal levels of stress, anger, and depression up to five years after a hate crime takes place. I think it's not an exaggeration to say that a five-minute assault in a shopping mall or a commuter train can tear a life apart. And that brings to mind a saying that you might have heard from your doctor, which is, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So wouldn't it be amazing if people could be trained in ways they could intervene to prevent at least a few of these crimes from happening or to put a stop to assaults once they're in progress? Well, the encouraging thing is that research tells us that this kind of situational readiness can actually be learned. So today, I wanna to give you a kind of mental toolkit that you can use to prepare yourself to act if you ever see someone being bullied abused, or degraded. And just a little bit of knowledge can help you feel confident enough to choose heroic action over inaction, and that knowledge can make a huge life-changing difference to somebody who's being targeted. Um, so my first challenge to you is to make connections with people who are very different from you. Now, this might seem like kind of an odd piece of advice, and it's fair to ask, what does your ability to make these kinds of connections have to do with your potential for heroic intervention? Well, in the simplest terms, when you get to know someone who looks different than you, worships differently, or just has different ideas about the world, what naturally starts to happen is that you start to identify with them more. Uh, you come to know them more fully as unique and worthy and valuable human beings just like you despite everything that supposedly divides you. And this is actually the foundation for everything that comes after, in that 
if you truly come to see people, all people, as unique and worthy and valuable in this way, uh, that's what's going to give you the motivation to act on their behalf when they're the most in need. And, but however motivated you feel to uh, protect someone who's being targeted by hate spewers, you also need to be ready to be the first to speak up. Now humans, we're a very social species, and as a result, we tend to look to other people around us for cues on what to do. And there's a famous study called the Ash Conformity Experiment that shows how looking for those cues can sometimes lead us really far off course. So in the experiment, uh, subjects were shown a picture of one line, and then they were shown a picture of three other lines, and they were asked, OK, which of these three lines is equal to the first line in length? You know, sounds pretty straightforward, right? Like, right out of kindergarten. But uh, in fact, what happened in the experiment was when people around the subject consistently gave the wrong answer to the line length question, the subjects themselves often gave the wrong answer too, even when what they were saying totally contradicted what their eyes were telling them. So yeah, under the wrong circumstances, we're all pretty vulnerable to this kind of mindless conformity, which is pretty depressing. But in another version of the ASH experiments, um, people, when there were several people around who gave the wrong answer to the line length question, but when there was just one other person in the room that gave the right answer, um, the subjects were much less likely to go along with the bad judgment of that crowd. And so what that suggests is that if you can set a social standard by being the first to say, hey, leave them alone, or show some respect, um, you can actually inspire other people to follow your lead. And an another way to stand up for what's right, instead of just what's socially acceptable, is to practice being conspicuous, uh, find ways to feel really, really comfortable uh, standing out in a crowd. And one way you can do that is to find something that you can do in public that makes you feel really odd, awkward, or uncomfortable. It could be something like, you know, shaving off a little patch of your hair, um, playing your favorite musical instrument on a street corner for tips, or even, you know, getting up on a stage to, uh, to give a speech like this. But um, whatever it is, the idea is that the more you practice being conspicuous in these kind of lower risk situations, um, you're going to feel much more comfortable when you have to be conspicuous in a big way to stand up for somebody who really needs it. And to increase your comfort factor even more, I would really recommend educating yourself. And that can mean finding a workshop or a course that teaches the art of effective bystander intervention. And a couple examples might be, uh, there's one called Hollaback, and there's another one called Responsibility, which was actually started up by a friend of the Hero Roundtable. Um, but what people report who have gone through this kind of situation-specific training is that, yes, like, they are able to intervene in a more active way if they're in a situation where a heroic response is needed. Um, but whether you've taken any kind of bystander intervention or not, um, you should also learn to press the mental pause button in order to make sure that your real-life acts actually line up with your deepest moral beliefs. Now, as you guys have probably experienced, um, when a situation gets really tense, it's really easy to act almost reflexively without really putting very much thought into it at all. And the psychologist Phil Zimbardo, who also founded the Heroic Imagination Project, says that one way to push past this kind of internal resistance is to practice a kind of mindfulness moment to moment. And what that can look like in a tense situation is like taking five seconds or 10 seconds to check in with yourself and say, what do I really want to do in this situation? Or what response would reflect who I really want to be? And 
The nice thing about checking in with yourself like this is it's kind of a good way to mentally nudge yourself back onto the moral path that you say you want to be on. Of course, there are times when you might decide that it's foolhardy to just confront an aggressor face to face, no matter how prepared you feel. And in those kind of situations, um, what might be a lot safer is actually to practice distraction by showing caring and concern to the person who's being targeted. And so, for example, if you see someone who's being verbally abused in public, uh, Leisha Brooks at Southern Poverty Law Center actually recommends just striking up a really friendly conversation with them. And it can be on just any neutral topic, whether it's, I love your necklace, where did you get it? Or like, man, I've got a really long day ahead of me today. Are, are you headed to work too? And so the idea here is that you're showing support to the person who's being targeted, but you're also demonstrating your support of that person to the aggressor, and that you can do both of those things without ever engaging the aggressor directly. And the other nice thing about this tactic is that you can um, actually give the aggressor sort of an excuse to back down uh, if he or she is starting to have second thoughts. And I can't underscore the safety part enough. Um, it's really important to remember that intervening effectively does not have to involve becoming a martyr. So don't be afraid to ask for help if you need it. Before you act, uh, mentally scroll through all your available options, which includes the less risky ones. Um, and, you know, if you're watching a hateful incident unfold, there's a lot to be said for just, like, placing a discreet phone call to police or, or transit authorities, or maybe just alerting someone official who's in the vicinity. Or if someone's already been hurt and you're in a crowded place, like maybe a restaurant or a subway station, you can try yelling out, I need a doctor, quickly. And when you broadcast your message like this, it really increases the chances um, that somebody nearby who's qualified is going to be able to help. And remember when I asked you about that time you regret, the time you stood on the sidelines when somebody else got hurt? I wasn't bringing that up to, to make you feel guilty, or, well, maybe just a tiny bit. But um, you, if that really bothers you, if that is an experience that's stuck in your mind, you can use it to inspire you to do something different the next time. And think of Christine Iverson. Um, and she actually heard about, in her community, a cross that was being burned in the yard of a Portuguese woman. And instead of doing nothing, Christine actually, um, first she called up the woman to make sure that she was okay, and then she got in touch with a friend of hers who headed up like an anti-racism organization. And she also, later on, helped put together an anti-racism rally. And what Christine uh, said to an interviewer was, I had to do something. And so I got up and I made that phone call and everything else came from that moment of decision. And with the right kind of preparation, you can also triumph at that critical moment of decision, showing love and concern, rather than letting hate blaze a destructive trail. Thank you so much. The Hero Roundtables are the global events that ask the question, what is a hero? You've just seen one hero talk, to find more and join the conversation, visit our website or social media.